Hello, my name is Ruby and I'm going to be reading excerpts from the book Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry Itleon, written by Dr. Don Mabalon with Gail Ramasanta, illustrations by Andre Sabayan. But first, let's get to know a little bit about Larry Itleon. Larry Itleon, 1913 to 1977, was a Filipino immigrant, farm labor organizer, and civil rights leader who led the 1965 Delano Grape Strike and co-founded the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and other Filipino and Mexican brothers and sisters. His leadership helped spark the farm workers movement, one of the most important American social justice movements of the 20th century. Larry Itliang immigrated to the United States in 1929 from the Philippines when he was 15 years old and immediately began working as a farm laborer in the salmon canneries of Alaska. His heart was set on becoming an attorney and seeking justice for the poor. But the poverty he lived through and violent racism he and Filipinos encountered all but barred him from getting the education he initially sought. He never became an attorney, but he became a storied Filipino-American labor leader and organizer, leading labor organizations in Alaska and throughout the West Coast. When Larry left his hometown, San Nicolas, in the province of Pangasinan, Philippines, he boarded the ship, the Empress of Asia. All the Filipinos on the ship had dreams of going to school and getting an education, and maybe becoming a lawyer, nurse, and finding a rich future in the United States. The trip took 22 days. When Larry landed in Seattle, Washington, it was gray, drizzly, and cold. One of his uncles lived in Seattle and met him at the pier. Let's go meet other Pinoys. Pinoys, that's the nickname for Filipinos in America, his uncle said. He lowered his voice. Do you have any money, he asked. I'm out of work and I could use $5 for food and rent. This took Larry by surprise as they walked toward Chinatown in downtown Seattle. As they approached King Street, Larry saw hundreds of Filipinos in stylish suits, hanging out in the sidewalks and talking loudly in many Filipino languages and in English. He heard one young man speaking Ilocano. So he introduced himself. We're Alaskaros, workers in the salmon canneries in Alaska, the young man told him. We're waiting for the season to start. After the cannery season, we go up and down California, throughout Washington, and even to Montana, harvesting fruits and vegetables. One of the older men showed Larry his rough, calloused hands. We harvest grapes, onions, tomatoes, asparagus, potatoes, peaches, lettuce, celery, and more, he said. The work is so hard and my back always hurts, but I send money home to my family so they can live a better life in the Philippines. Larry walked further down King Street, where he met another Ilocano. I attended the University of Washington and studied to become a lawyer, he said, but I had to quit to earn money. We all work in canneries, restaurants, or as house cleaners or servants. If you have brown skin, you can't get any other kind of job. He told Larry that he and others from his town in the Philippines put together what little money they had to buy food and rent a small apartment. Larry felt like he was punched in the gut. He thought, this is life in America? After two weeks in Seattle, Larry heard that a farmer in Montana needed workers to harvest sugar beets. He said goodbye to his uncle and hopped on a train to Montana. There, Larry woke before dawn and worked with a crew of Filipinos who hunched over the land for hours under a relentless sun during the day and in the freezing wind at night. They worked with no breaks, toilets, or clean drinking water, and they slept in old barns and dusty bunkhouses with dirt floors. Larry's back and knees ached and his sore muscles made him toss and turn at night. He had to wear a wide-brimmed hat, long sleeves, and boots for protection from the sun and dust. He sometimes worked 12 hours or more a day and had no days off. The farmers also used poisonous chemicals called pesticides on the crops to kill the insects that damaged the crops, but the pesticides also hurt the workers. After the season was over, Larry found a job working on the railroad in Montana. One day while he was riding the train, he realized that he missed his stop. With the train going full speed, Larry jumped off, but his right pinky finger got caught in the train door. He lost a lot of blood, and stayed in the hospital for three months. His fingers were so damaged that the doctor had to amputate or surgically remove three fingers on his right hand. After Larry healed, his friends in the United States gave him a new nickname, Seven Fingers. He wrote a letter to his family about the accident, and he looked for a new job. Larry's father wrote back and suggested that he could go to college in Manila and live with an uncle there. Larry wondered what his former classmates would think of him. He left for America with big hopes, only to come home with nothing. Even worse, he would return with three fewer fingers. Larry wrote back right away. 
No, I came here of my own free will, and if I can't lick this problem by myself, then I am nobody, he wrote. Larry returned to Washington, where he got a job as a janitor at the fried lettuce farm for 12 cents an hour. Every day, Larry watched the Filipino workers stoop low and move quickly, row after row, cutting the heads of lettuce from the roots in the earth for 10 cents an hour. On the farm, the white workers received 15 cents an hour for an easier job. They washed and packed lettuce in the boxes in a nearby shed, preparing them to be shipped all over the nation. Soon, the white workers demanded a 10 cent raise. When the bosses said no, the white workers went on a strike. A strike is when all workers agree to stop working. Together, they demand a higher wage and better working conditions. If the employer agrees to workers' demands, the strike ends and the workers return to work. The white shed workers asked the Filipinos to join them in the strike and promised the Filipinos that they would not go back to work unless everyone got a raise. The Filipinos agreed, and the next day, more than 500 Filipino workers demanded a 5 cent raise. Until they got it, they refused to work. Larry joined the strike. Why are you going on a strike? You work inside, the superintendent shouted. Larry responded, these are my people. If I stay here in the office, I would be a chicken. After three weeks of the strike, the employer Fry Lettuce Farm gave the white workers a 10 cent raise. And they returned to work. The Filipinos did not receive a raise. Larry felt angry. We only asked for five cents, he thought. He and the other Filipinos felt betrayed. And even worse, despite their promises to the Filipino workers to stand in unity with them, the shed workers found scabs or replacement workers for the Filipinos who went on strike, and all the Filipinos lost their jobs. Another word for scabs is strike breaker. If employers have replacement workers, they don't have to agree to the demands of those who are on strike, and then the strike is broken. The experience taught Larry an important lesson. All workers had to be unified in their fight for justice. Larry also went to Alaska to work in the canneries. Many Filipinos worked in the canneries of Alaska. When the summer ended, Larry left Alaska and went to California. He worked all over the West Coast, riding freight trains and catching rides with friends. He canned sardines in San Pedro, harvested lettuce in Salinas, cut and packed asparagus in the San Joaquin Delta near Stockton, and each summer he returned to work in the salmon canneries in Alaska. Larry and thousands of other immigrants and migrant workers who were doing the work of planting and harvesting fruits and vegetables made the growers and cannery owners very wealthy. These fruits and vegetables were sold all over the globe. Their labor transformed California into one of the richest economies in the world. The years went by quickly. He was working so hard to survive that he forgot about college. Through all of this, Larry was learning important lessons. Workers had a right to form a union and to be treated fairly and paid a living wage. In a union, the workers form an organization whose members stand together and agree on demands about their pay and working conditions. This is called collective bargaining. They could be a powerful force when unified. By this time, the nation was in the grip of the Great Depression. Millions of people lost their jobs, homes, and farms and were struggling to survive. Some blamed immigrants, particularly Mexicans and Filipinos, for taking all of the jobs even though that was not true. As he worked up and down the West Coast, Larry experienced brutal racism, hatred of people because of their skin color. Most cities in town practiced segregation or separation of people based on skin color. Many Filipinos and Filipinas could only live in areas called Little Manilas or in Chinatowns. One day while Larry was walking in downtown Stockton's Little Manila, a vibrant area full of Filipino stores, restaurants, and other businesses, Larry saw a group of white teenagers jump out of a car with baseball bats and call Filipinos terrible, ugly names, like brown monkey. They beat up as many Filipinos as they could before driving off. In most American cities, there were areas where Filipinos were not welcome. Larry saw signs that read, positively, no Filipinos allowed, and no dogs and no Filipinos allowed, in front of hotels, restaurants, and stores in Stockton and all over California. He heard stories of Filipino labor camps that had been bombed and the Filipinos who had been beaten. Some had been shot and killed. Larry's heart ached with sadness and anger at so much injustice all around him. Meanwhile, Larry's friend, Carlos Bulasan, was writing a book about the Filipino experience in the United States. In the book, he wrote, In many ways, it was a crime to be a Filipino in California. Filipinos could not become citizens, nor could they vote, own land, or marry whites. They were being treated like criminals in a land they had once been taught was the greatest country on earth. One day in 1959, Larry spotted his friend Rudy Delvo on El Dorado Street in Stockton's Little Manila. 
Larry, I just got a new job with a new farm labor union, Rudy exclaimed. I think this is a union that will finally bring us justice. Come and work with us as an organizer. Tell me more, Larry said. Rudy took him to the union office near Little Manila and told him all about the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, AWOC. We've heard that everybody depends on you, Larry, one of the union bosses told him. You do a lot of good things for Filipinos. Larry thought it over and agreed to join the union as an organizer. Larry met other energetic union organizers in Stockton, such as Mexican-American activist Dolores Huerta and Gilbert Padilla. One day, Dolores told Larry she was leaving. She, Gilbert, and their friend, Cesar Chavez, were organizing Mexican-American grape workers into a workers' association in a small town called Delano, four hours south of Stockton in the Central Valley. By going to as many farms as possible up and down the Central Valley and talking to everyone he could, Larry recruited more than 1,000 new members to the AWOC. He was so good at organizing workers that the union leaders asked Larry to move to Delano to lead the Filipino grape workers. So Larry moved to Delano. Once there, he recruited two tough and smart Filipino organizers, Pete Manuel and Ben Gines. In May of 1965, the Filipino grape workers in Coachella Valley, in the southern tip of California, New Mexico, were angry. The farmers were paying some workers $1.40 an hour, but only giving Filipino workers $1.25 an hour. Ben Gines called Larry. We have to go on strike, Ben insisted. Larry agreed. The AWC workers demanded $1.40 per hour and $0.25 cents a box for grapes from the growers in Coachella Valley. The police arrested many of the strikers. Because they were united and the farmers were desperate for workers, the growers gave them what they demanded after 10 days of the strike. The workers finished the harvest and then went north to Delano, where the grapes were sweet and heavy on the vine. It was time for the harvest. When the workers arrived in Delano, the grape growers refused to give them the same wage. On September 7, 1965, Larry invited hundreds of AWC members and all the growers to meet at Filipino Hall in Delano to negotiate, but the growers didn't show up. Larry and AWC union leaders, such as Ben Gaines, Pete Manuel, and Pete Velasco, led the discussion in the crowded hall. They spoke in many different Filipino languages, like Ilocano, Visayan, and Tagalog, and also in English so everyone could understand. Not all the AWC members were Filipino. Some were African American, Arab, Puerto Rican, Mexican, and some were white. But what about my wife and children? We might go hungry, a Filipino worker argued. One elderly Filipino stood up. We're not getting any younger, he shouted. This might be our last chance to win a good wage and the right to form a union. Many nodded their heads. Bob Armington, a leader in the community, raised his hand. I move that we vote to go on strike, he said. The crowd went silent. Larry called out. I want those in favor to stand up with your hand raised. Everyone stood up and raised their right hand in the air. It was unanimous. They were going on strike. The next day, September 8th, the Great Delano Grape Strike began. More than 2,000 members of AWC walked off grape vineyards, leaving the grapes hanging on the vine and yelling, Welga, strike! Their demand was simple, $1.40 per hour, 25 cents a box, and the right to form a union. The workers walked around the vineyards across Delano, shouting and holding signs. Growers hired armed guards who beat the strikers with sticks and shot at them. The growers shut off the power and water from the workers' bunkhouses. When the strikers tried to cook their meals over campfires, the guards kicked over their pots and threw their food on the ground. Next, the guards kicked the workers out of their camps so strikers had to sleep under the trees or in their cars. Their growers began hiring Mexican workers as scabs to replace the Filipinos who went on strike. The AWC members felt hurt and angry and betrayed by the growers. In some cases, it had been the Filipino grape workers who taught the growers how to grow grapes. Larry had an idea. He knew that justice for farm workers could be realized if the two biggest groups of farm workers, Filipinos and Mexicans, could unite. He remembered what happened in the lettuce fields when the white workers abandoned the Filipinos. For many decades, he saw that the growers made sure Filipinos and Mexicans lived in separate camps and were paid different wages so that they would always fight each other instead of the growers. He knew that if the two communities stood together in unity, also called solidarity, they would be even stronger. They might even win. Larry knew what he had to do. In Delano, Cesar Chavez, Gilbert Padilla, and Dolores Huerta were building the membership of the National Farm Workers Association. NFWA, which was made up of mostly Mexican Americans. Larry went to see Caesar. He asked Caesar and the NFWA to join the Filipinos on strike. 
Caesar, if Mexican workers break the strike, we'll never win, Larry told him. Then when the Mexicans go on strike, the Filipinos will cross their picket line. The growers will always win. Caesar Chavez shook his head. We're not ready for a strike, he said. But he promised Larry that the NFWA would discuss it and vote. Caesar knew if they joined the Filipinos on strike, and if they won, they would help make lives better for all workers. More than a thousand NFWA members crowded shoulder to shoulder into Guadalupe Church in Delano on a warm summer night to discuss the strike and vote. Dolores spoke first, and she told the crowd about the violent guards and how they humiliated the Filipino workers. Then Caesar spoke. The strike was begun by Filipinos, but it is not exclusively for them. Tonight, we must decide if we are to join our fellow workers. The crowd roared. The vote was unanimous. The NFWA joined with AWC to go on strike. The strikers shared Filipino Hall as their union hall and strike kitchen, and they picketed together. For the first time, Mexicans and Filipinos spoke as one for the rights of workers. Most importantly, all of the strikers agreed to be nonviolent. Caesar knew that the civil rights movement had achieved many of its goals through nonviolence. This meant that all of the workers, many of whom who always had to defend themselves with knives, guns, and their fists from violent attacks from racist growers and the police, had to learn how to fight for justice through nonviolent peaceful protest. The strikers picketed the vineyards and fields, packing sheds and storage plants, sometimes standing on cars with bullhorns, encouraging other workers to walk off the vineyards. One of the elderly Filipino workers, Paulo Agbayani, died from a heart attack while he was picketing. The growers refused to budge. Something had to be done to get the attention of the nation. Larry, Caesar, AWC, and NFWA, and many of the union leaders, including Dolores Huerta, Gilbert Padilla, Philip Veracruz, Pete Velasco, and Andy Imluthan, along with hundreds of strikers, marched 340 miles north through the Central Valley from Delano to the state capital in Sacramento. The sun was blistering and their feet ached. They carried banners of La Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary of Mexico, and American, Mexican, and Philippine flags, as well as the AWC flag and the Red Eagle flag of the NFWA. At first, dozens of policemen blocked them in Delano. In each town, people joined them or lined the route and cheered them on. The strikers and supporters shouted, Viva la Huelga! Long live the strike! And Mabuhay ang Panoy! Long live the Filipinos! In Stockton, more than 5,000 people met them with songs and encouragement. When they got to Sacramento on Easter Sunday, thousands of cheering people greeted them in front of the Capitol. The next year, the two unions became one. They formed the United Farm Workers, also known as the UFW, with Cesar Chavez as the director and Larry Itliong as the assistant director. The other union leaders included the Filipino AWC leaders, Philip Veracruz and Andy Imutan and NFWA leaders Dolores Huerta and Gilbert Padilla. The UFW decided they would send volunteers across the nation to ask people all over the world to boycott, refuse to buy grapes from Delano, to force the growers to listen to their demands. In the five long years of the grape strike and boycott, millions of people across the nation donated money, food, and clothing to the UFW. They began to care about farm workers. At Christmas, People from all over the world donated toys for the children of the strikers. Filipina and Mexican women and many volunteers cooked meals every day in the Filipino hall to feed hundreds of strikers. The two communities sang songs together, shared their food and cultures, and created strong bonds of friendship over chicken adobo, tamales, fish head soup, bitter melon, beans, tortillas, and steamed rice. The union members began calling each other brother and sister. In 1970, more than 30 grape growers in Delano met with the UFW and agreed to pay increase, a medical insurance plan, and control over toxic pesticides. This was a significant victory for the union and the workers. Farmers, union members, and the press gathered at the UFW headquarters, 40 acres, to sign the contracts. As Larry signed the new contracts, his fingers felt the rush of his signature and the enormity of the moment. He knew what this meant for his people and all farm workers. For his entire life, he worked to create a union for farm workers. He and his fellow workers had walked a long journey for justice and stayed their course. He had fulfilled his dream from so long ago. He did it. They did it. By October of 1971, nearly six years after the grape strike began, and five years after the formation of the UFW, Larry finally resigned from the UFW, but he didn't retire. He still supported justice for farm workers, and he had so much work to do. 
He focused on helping elderly Filipinos with their problems, and he encouraged Filipinos to vote and run for office. He traveled all over the nation talking to young Filipino Americans who asked him for advice on how to achieve justice. Many activists and community members have worked together to remember the legacy of Larry Itliong. In 2014, the first Filipino American California Assembly member, Rob Bonta, authored Assembly Bill 7 designating Larry Itliong Day. As a result, the state of California in 2015 named October 25th Larry Itliong Day for public schools to celebrate his birthday and to encourage learning communities to learn more about Larry's accomplishments. A middle school in Union City, California was also renamed Itliong Vera Cruz Middle School. Finally, in 2020, Governor Gavin Newsom proclaimed October 25th as Larry Itliong Day in California so that all Californians can celebrate the legacy of Larry Itliong and his role in the farm labor movement. A few things to think about after we read the book. How are we taught to view and value labor? How do you build solidarity within social movements? What is the role of art and culture within social movements? Thank you for joining me today. Reading and thinking about Journey for Justice, the life of Lair Itliang, and the role Filipinos played in the farm worker movement. To read the full book, Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry Itliong, and have access to a timeline, resources, and historical locations, you can purchase the book at www.bridgedelta.com or amazon.com, or ask your local library to get one for your community. A free teacher's guide, courtesy of Panay Panoy Educational Partnerships, is also available online at www.bridgedelta.com and at pepsf.org.